One of the things that we want to do today Okay, well let's let's get started. Before we do, there are a couple rules of play here. One is that we have to, because we're online, and it's going to be pretty permanent because the province, the Western Province, is sending us candidates for formation. So uh, we have one I just received and I acknowledged on Wednesday from Montreal, Canada, originally from Coeur d'Alene. She is unfortunately working in Montreal, and I say unfortunately because it's probably a great joy to her, but everything's locked down there. That said, we welcome her and others. It also includes Andrew Bartel, uh, Michael from Coeur d'Alene, uh, and lots of other people, uh, Lydia and John from Moscow. So we are going to continue the online presence. So because of that, I want to be mindful of this microphone. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. The rather uh, expensive micro group microphone we bought is just simply not working. So what that means is that whoever is speaking and at the time of the Q&A, and that's the other rule is, but at the time of the Q&A we'll be passing the microphone around. Because this little microphone that Joe Mercury bought for the chapter works rather well, at least for the online presence. And so we will, so we're gonna have to, so reserve questions to the end of the talks. And if you need some paper to make notes, that's all great. And that goes for online too, just for the simple fact that that way we can hand you the microphone and go from there and answer questions in an ordered manner. Um, so, the program today starts off with Father Peter Doe, and we'll have a break, and then we will do, uh, I would have a presentation, and then we are a little behind, we are going to do an update on the colloquium. We're setting a meeting for the colloquium, uh, for organizing it. We have the speakers lined up, and we'll go through that later. Then, potluck lunch. Rosary right after that, and then I have uh, a talk, um, and Alana, and then Pamela later in the afternoon, and uh, Father Peter Doe. So we have an ambitious schedule, we are a little behind, so uh, we want to be, and should be wrapped up here at 3.30, no later than 4 as the door closes behind us. So, there we go. And then, of course, before we leave, we'll be singing the Salve Regina. And that will be our closing prayer. Okay, so I want to also thank Carolyn for her mm -hmm. work on this, and Alana and Pamela. And Jim, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I've been, have my head in the work for the last two weeks, so I so appreciate it. And uh, I want to also thank you for Father Peter Doe for being here, coming in, and uh, have enjoyed uh, visiting with him. So take your time, visit with him. The other, and lastly, before I turn it over to him, we have a sign-up sheet at the front door and name tag, so if you don't have one, please sign up and get a name tag or both. Uh, that's important, as we know, who is here. We have a record, uh, which we're supposed to keep. One of the things that we're gonna be doing somewhere during lunch is the election for formation director. Joshua, who I noted in an email to uh, the council the other day, has been a real asset and I, I can't say enough how much I've appreciated Josh's approach, work, and uh, I've encouraged him. Uh, hopefully, he someday can return to our chapter, but I've encouraged him to uh, stay in touch. 
so I'm going to do that one more time. That said, he is leaving for Montana and we need to replace the formation director. We're going to up the duties a little bit. We're going to try to create a formation team, but we'll talk more on that later once I've got, we've got somebody elected. Um, and that will be at lunch, or hopefully at the end of lunch. Any questions before we get started? Let's just invoke the Holy Spirit, ask him to be with us, and the prayers of St. Dominic, we delve into his prayer charism, we ask this, the blessings of Almighty God uh, on this assembly, and we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father. We good? Yeah, you should be. Okay, well let's let's get started. Before we do, there are a couple rules of play here. One is that we have to, because we're online, and it's going to be pretty permanent because the province, the Western Province, is sending us candidates for formation. So. Uh, we have one I just received and I acknowledged on Wednesday from Montreal, Canada, originally from Coeur d'Alene. She is unfortunately working in Montreal, and I say unfortunately because it's probably a great joy to her, but everything's locked down there. That said, we welcome her and others. It also includes Andrew Bartell, uh, Michael from Coeur d'Alene, uh, and lots of other people, uh, Lydia, John from Moscow. So we are going to continue the online presence. So because of that, I want to be mindful of this microphone. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. The rather uh, expensive micro group microphone we bought is just simply not working. So what that means is that whoever is speaking and at the time of the Q&A, and that's the other rule, is but at the time of the Q&A, we'll be passing the microphone around. Because this little microphone that Joe Mercury bought for the chapter works rather well, at least for the online presence. And so we will, so we're gonna have to, so reserve questions to the end of the talks. And if you need some paper to make notes, that's all great. And that goes for online too, just for the simple fact that that way we can hand you the microphone and go from there and answer questions in an ordered manner. Um, so the program today starts off with Father Peter Doe, and we'll have a break, and then we will do, uh, I would have a presentation, and then we are a little behind, we are gonna do an update on the colloquium. We're setting a meeting for the colloquium, uh, for organizing it. We have the speakers lined up and we'll go through that later. Then potluck lunch, rosary right after that. And then I have uh, a talk um, and Alana and then Pamela later in the afternoon and uh, Father Peter Doe. So we have an ambitious schedule. We are a little behind. So uh, we want to be and should be wrapped up here at 3.30, no later than 4 as the door closes behind us. So there we go. And then, of course, before we leave, we'll be singing the Salve Regime. And that will be our closing prayer. Okay, so I want to also thank Carolyn for her mm -hmm. work on this and Alon and Pamela. have a sign-up sheet at the front door and name tag so if you don't have one please sign up and get a name tag or both 
Uh, that's important, as we know who is here. We have a record uh, which we're supposed to keep. One of the things that we're going to be doing somewhere during lunch is the election for formation director. Joshua, who I noted in an email to uh, the council the other day, has been a real asset. And I, I can't say enough how much I've appreciated Joshua's approach, work, and uh, I've encouraged him. Uh, hopefully, he someday can return to our chapter, but I've encouraged him to uh, stay in touch. So, I'm going to do that one more time. That said, he is leaving for Montana. We need to replace the formation director. We're going to up the duties a little bit. We're going to try to create a formation team, but we'll talk more on that later once I've got we've got somebody elected. Um, and that will be at lunch, or hopefully at the end of lunch. Any questions before we get started? Let's just invoke the Holy Spirit, ask him to be with us, and the prayers of St. Dominic as we delve into his charism. We ask this, the blessings of Almighty God uh, on this assembly. And we do so in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father. And I want to say, um, I think most everybody knows that Sandra is our new officer on the council. And she's the treasurer. And I'm really... Uh, and I also, uh, I so appreciate Sandra and willingness to help. And that includes for today's retreat, Sandra. Thank you for your help. Not only as treasurer, but in helping get everything together today. Yeah. Um, the next talk is, of course, based on the Quo Vadis theme. Uh, it's something that I put together uh, not quickly. I've been thinking about it for over a couple months, but I find myself typing it up. So please bear with me, because I'm going to kind of read it and kind of not. So it's important that uh, it gets into some challenging ideas and some things we want to discuss. So I'm going to just pretend like I'm standing in front of the court or whatever and making our um, so that I more relax myself. You know, Christ is king. He's king of the universe. He's the king of our nation, and of our societies, and most certainly of ourselves. Even if we as individuals or a society fail to acknowledge his kingship, it does not detract from that reality. His sovereignty over us, our family and nation, flows from this kingship. As sovereign, we owe him due worship, obeisance, and honor. We owe him simply everything. As Catholics, we believe that the Bible, that the church, rather, is his bride. That we as members of the church are his body, which means that the church is temporal as well as heaven-bound, and we live in it. An ancient question that has existed for nearly 2,000 years or more is the relationship between church and state. And Christ answered that to a certain extent as to taxes and certainly other matters, claiming that give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. It was St. Thomas of Becket, a thousand years later, a former friend and confidant of Henry, King Henry II of England, was martyred in the year 1170, by the way, the same year that St. Dominic was born. For his stand, he took as Archbishop of Canterbury that the English crown had little or no authority over the church and could not arrest a priest who had been accused of rape. It was, and the priest was subject to Becket's authority, not the crown's. In America, the First Amendment formalized the separation of the established church and the state. You know, the relevant portion of the First Amendment reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Father made the distinction earlier between freedom of religion and freedom of worship. 
And you've seen this in public argument. I don't know if you've paid attention over the last eight years since Obama left office and during his realm that this distinction was raised by the courts. There exists discussion among Catholics to this day of the nature of government and its duty owed to Christ as sovereign king. The debate will not be covered thoroughly today. It is important to understand the concerns raised by such debate. After all, even if it be the will of God, his will is not fully instituted here on earth. For as it says in the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The sovereignty of Christ over all mankind must be first lived by Catholics in their personal and public lives. It need not be codified in a positive law, but such sovereignty must be maintained in the negative. In other words, whereby it limits the state or the government, another word for state, from establishing a religion and from the free exercise thereof, and not to abuse, interfere with, overtax, or oppress those who exercise their religion. From here, before the founding of the United States of America, it is a very good recall to learn of Europe and the faithlessness that occurred of the princes and kings of Europe and the persecution of Christians. It's a very real thing, and that's why the fruit of many people of the United the freedom of conscience here in the United States of America. From its founding, firmly planted in the Judeo-Christian ethic, with the tradition of the Jewish, the Greek, and the Roman civilization at its side, the time had come for the United States. Its declaration of independence avowed objective truth as self-evident, natural law that rules the civil, moral, and physical affairs of mankind, and Um, let's see. I missed the, the wrong. Natural rules of physical affairs of mankind and creation. That all men have dignity and were created equal. And then in that creation, each had certain unalienable rights, including, but not limited to, life, liberty, and property. Its constitution rec recognizes the dignity of mankind created by God and limited government under a constitutional system based on the rule of law, structured limitations, and due process that set forth the negative law prohibiting the Congress from making law in certain matters. These include religion, state church, assembly, redress of grievances, and of course the right to bear arms. The civil law must be rooted in realism of truth and the natural law. You know, after all, men are men and women are women, and there are objective realities to which men and women must conform their minds, their beliefs, their status, and their behavior. We don't look to identity, ideology, foolishness, sentiment, whim, wishful thinking, or race the ideology for, for ruling, but we must look to objective truth. Whether under the oppressive regime or a free society, it is the church's duty to set the agenda for the world. Contra mundum. And it's not vice versa. Duty to avoid these ideologies and delusions and utopias of today, not those, but we must ground it in scripture and sacred tradition. tradition. You know, the world changes, but certainly the church abides. This reality, grounded on the natural law, is mm -hmm. Catholic. As surely as the Father is real, as Christ is real, and as surely as the Holy Spirit is present among us. The Eucharist is the true body, blood, and soul and divinity of Christ. You know, there's nothing subjective or ambiguous about these realities, and it is upon this rock that the church is built. The world is subject to the fall. We suffer from original sin. It is sure that all things crumble and decay. This is no less true in the society of mankind. Whatever its institutional basis, no matter how the the fine structure of constitution that they have. It, it was true, certainly at the time of St. Bennett. As some of you know, in the year 500, he walked the despoiled and shameful streets of Rome, witnessing the decay and failure of a thousand-year-old civilization. You know, at the time the emperor had been deposed by about 31 years, and the church had been what was left over to 
to uphold order and society. Today we recall times that to some people are called a time of judgment on our nation, our own institutions, and certainly on the peace and order of society. You know, after the rise of the American Republic in the 18th century, we witnessed the demise of what the French called the ancien regime of the French kings in the French Republic, a system that today that we know is not entirely maybe demonic, but it was seriously depraved in any truth and certainly faith and reason, of movement seeking utopia and a profound cost of human life, a precursor to the ideology of communism, Marxism, Maoism, and the like. Archbishop Sheen, 50 years ago, described the radical differences between the American War of Independence and the French Revolution, encouraging the student to look to the leaders at the top. You know, the French revolt was based upon violence for its own sake, a type of terror, the confiscation of property, and the destruction of human rights, destruction of tradition, history, and all that existed in the past. It's a belief that people could save themselves ultimately through violence and change. One of the components of the revolt, proponents of the revolt, was Louis-Antoine Lyon Saint-Just, who urged par Parliament to embrace the notion that, quote, now can you imagine this on the floor of the U.S. Congress? A nation generates itself only upon heaps of force, corpses, close quote. He was of 26 years of age, a brilliant man indeed, but nevertheless evil. He died at the guillotine at the hands of his treacherous compatriots. Sheen claimed the source of the ideas come from what he called elitism, to make a lot of noise, and forces it upon others, warning to keep their eye on man who has the biggest bullhorn. Those who seek to destroy property rights, life, and seek to burn buildings, destroy small businesses, and society itself. Does this sound familiar? Be not deceived if there are people that profit from violence. Another cause he identified was called political mysticism. There's no spiritual realm or basis. There's no God, there's no alternative, but to live for today. And finally, he identified Satanism, which I indeed believe is behind all this. Satanism hates mankind and seeks to destroy personal and social morality, ethics, law, and ordered liberty in self-government. These ideas are supported by the St. Justs of our modern era, proving there is nothing new under the sun. In contrast, look at the leaders of the American War. For instance, by reference, Thomas Jefferson, whose writings clearly articulated the ideals of ordered liberty and self-government. They were grounded on the dignity and respect of each individual. That all rights and liberties come from God under the certainty and rule of natural law. Setting up a due process that is shielded against tyranny, the process of the courts. Where do these rights come from? From kings, from Congress, from the majority? You know, his answer is, it is self-evident that God had endowed men with certain inalienable rights not subject to the winds of the ruler. In there is hope as God stirs our nation to bring back the Lord as the king of our nation. It is self-evident that God has endowed man with certain inalienable rights and to bring back the Lord as the king of the nation, to bring back the reality of God as providence, the providence almighty upon which we depend. Real reform comes from Christ, not to tear down the structure and order of society and direct, direct directly, kind of a direction of order mirrored in heaven. But it's for us as Catholics to have the humility to change our own lives, to bring back order, to bring truth to reason, and right thinking to the political, social, ecclesial, educational, and governmental structures of our nation. And my say of today emphasize ecclesial. The key heresy of our time might be called activism, which is a thinking disorder that ignores the re reality of original sin and the fallen nature of mankind, believing that human nature is malleable and perfectible, not through Christ's grace or his church, 
but by the active recreating, recreating of government and society in the image of mankind through advocacy, through collective law, collectivist laws, legal plunder, excessive taxation, big government, massive welfare state, and the takeover of private property and the like. This type of activism works oftentimes with violence, social unrest, at unrest, and the cancellation of culture, historical ideals, and destruction of heroes and icons of our nation. It feeds on a utopian ideal that all that is needed is to change the government, social, or economic order is to simply reform society through violence or social unrest. Social unrest creates instability and insecurity. People must die, therefore change comes. Today in modern America, we see where the ignorance of history, of tradition, and of truth encourages the foolish to seek unnatural solutions. Why unnatural? Because they are against human nature. These include, of course, Marxism, Maoism, progressivism, all of which are the brand that denies the nature of fallen humanity. You know, as to these, our fathers and grandfathers and mothers have fought against these evil in the name of freedom. Yet the unfaithful of prior generations and the current youth bring about a new faith or a new ignorance of huge proportions that enables these ideologies to again thrive. It also promotes a progressivism. You know, we've heard the race theories and practices that are destroying our civilization with an incredible audacity without any basis in reason, intellect, or truth. You know, while denying objective reality, many today declare themselves a man or a woman, same sex, marriage, and on and on. The list we could, we could go on. The building of ideologies and theories on self-declared words, regardless of lies and half-truths, in the midst of that, we deny Christ himself. And the world is full of it. You know, I was reading in a magazine the other day, there was a man who declared himself a woman in order to run in, in track. And he won some races. They didn't let him go to the Olympics, thank God. But uh, in the magazine, it has a picture of him running. He has this long hair, and the picture's really kind of odd. You know, I was in the ninth and 10th grade. I remember asking my dad, what was the difference between why girls couldn't run faster than boys? And he told me, you know, he says, basically, men have narrow hips, larger lungs, more muscle mass, larger frame, and can run faster. And here's this picture of this guy running, long hair, trying to be a girl, and it's like, Dude, you're not a girl. <laughs> so, it's just, and what did he say in the magazine? He says, quote, I love what I'm doing, and I'm getting to live my truth and my authentic life. I believe that this is my way of being the change that I want to see in the world. Please, God, please know. We call this nominalism. You know, you name it, believe it, and force it down other people's throats. The first of the real scary part is that throwing and forcing it down other people's throats is being codified into law. The effective, most of initial nominalist was Luther, who declared the meaning of Romans 3.28 contrary to history and tradition and to the fathers of the church. He created a schism, a schism, a new church, churches that have become invited, have become the thousands. You know, in denying the truth, deny himself, Christ. As faith fails, so does our institutions and the fundamental truths fade into memory. You know, in a discussion comparing historical Christianity and med medieval Christian and Catholic kings as compared to the modern government and secular world, an attorney friend of mine reflected in an email, who's also a member of this chapter, she said, quote, what would our distant ancestors of the Middle Ages have thought of babies being murdered by millions in their mother's wombs, or the fratricidal and genocidal slaughters of the French Revolution, the Civil War, and World War I and II? Which medieval Catholic monarch thought he could redefine marriage to include same-sex unions, or legalize contraceptives, or even impose sky-high taxes, taxes like we pay? How many Catholic nations, based on the entire economic system on usury as, as we have, how many of the mainstream pornography 
and fornication like we have? How many days of the year do we have to pay uh, to pay work to pay off our tax obligations to our masters as compared to our medieval ancestors? Do we even notice how slave driven we are? What we have over right now are godless oblig oligarchs who think of us as economic cows to be milked for their own benefit, and who do not even believe there is a hell, much less fear going there. We like to think that because we, we vote, they work for us. But if 2020 should have proven anything, it's that it's very much the other way around, close quote. You know, this paragraph raises peripheral issues about politics and systems, but it brilliantly asks and poses the question about our day, our faithless and godless error, that it thrones mankind, money, and pleasure above everything else. If this is the time of judgment in our nation, let's recognize it. Let's face it. It is observable about all of us. It's depravity, licentiousness, morality, deviancy, necromancy, and the like. And in government, corruption, decay, overtaxation, and certainly overspending. The welfare state, utter ignorance of history and the culture of tyranny. Look, you know, looking, locking, rather, God out of polite society, like businesses, schools, the courts, and the legislative halls. You know, likely the deepest depravity, which is hard to imagine, is the ele elevation of abortion of a kid, of a baby in the womb, and I say kid, in the womb as a human right, as reproductive freedom, as a constitutional legal right, and the other, just utter destruction of human beings at the hands of vacuums and poisons, chemicals, and the like. It makes Stalin and Hitler and all the rest of those bozos amateurs. It is utterly so monstrous it is hard to give it a name other than the tragedy that people, even Catholics, who engage in this lie. In the end, as we face this reality, what can be done either individually as a family or as a chapter? I say we must first recognize the truth for yourself, your family, and for the nation. You know, keep in prayer and keep a face like Flint fixed on your faith and your future. And where you have children, raise them in the faith. Tell them that you love them. Where you are involved in the profession, be mindful of your ethics, your words, and your actions. Be involved where you can, whether in professional societies, politics, or social clubs, and be ready to speak the truth. Yet in kindness, with reverence, pass on the faith. This is probably a time like no other in the history of the Holy Church, where we cannot look one another, one way or the other, but straight ahead with our eyes on Christ and the cross. In closing, it is Christ who admonishes his disciples to go out into the world and to preach and teach the gospel, to heal diseases and to cast out demons. My dear chapter, you belong to the order of preachers, the only one so named so far in it. And it is by that instrument that we are called personally by Christ to convert the world. There is power in preaching, for it's the one thing Christ called us to do. And in the reality of being prepared with the reason for your faith, do so in the spirit and in truth, with reverence and kindness. been so busy at work and that, that's why it's a little bit disordered so I, I don't want to give you a copy yet anybody else have any questions say that again yeah it's the mysticism that it's what Bishop Sheen talked about he's talking about the mysticism of being uh, religious, uh, spiritual, but not religious. The mysticism of the world uh, is one, and then putting and elevating personalities over God. 
or things over God. It's a mysticism that, or, or the New Age movement, or anything that is of this world or underworld that, raised, that is raised above God. It's the, that's the kind of mysticism he was talking about. It's, it's political, social, whatever subcategory you want to give it in that realm, if you place it in, that is really in order for this world, but above it. I recognize that from Fulton Sheen, yeah? The, yes. This, this video? Yeah. That, uh, yes. Cuvados America. So That's Cuvados how I, America. Th those details is how I read it. He didn't go into a great deal of yeah, he definition. Didn't. I don't know. But, but, yeah. Anybody else have any questions? Let's just search for that and listen to it. I have a comment, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, if you compare the Aztec nation at the time Cortez arrived, right, it was even worse than the Arab Anybody wants a good history of the conquering of Mexico, a book called The Conquering of Mexico by a friar that walked through it with Cortez. And he wrote it in his very old age, probably 70 years or 65, 70 years after that occurred. It's a really good short book and it describes in detail the slaughter of the people uh, in Mexico and what they did to try to preserve it. Um, my other comment. What was the other thing you said? Um, the, oh, with regard to rosary preaching. I, the, the chapter has studied some of Father Bark's works with regard to says that the Third Order speaks uh, with authority of the church. And we have to keep in mind the parameters of that. And he, he makes the point well made. And I'm happy to go. It, it's online. Um, that said, and then the other point with regard to, I think that's that's a great, I think that would be expanding the answer of what we can do is through prayer and fasting, of course, and the use of that, but. Yeah, well, um, I'm trying to deny preaching for the third order because you see Tim Catherine in Spanish and Darby. Yeah, no, I, and, and I. And she clearly do her letter writing and her instruction yeah. of others and so forth. Well, well it's. Of the preacher, it, it, it's such a, as was suitable for a nation. The, the cool thing about this guy Father was talking about earlier, and just before Nazi Germany attacked Czechoslovakia and Poland very early in the war, actually before it began, was he wrote letters to everyone. He just wrote lots of letters. And he got responses, yeses and noes from these various governments. But, it, but he was preaching in a way, dude, please, let's tell you this in this town. The other thing is, the reason why I bring up preaching is because it's a message that I'm giving to my friends that are priests and deacons. I have a friend that's in my Perseo fourth day, and I keep repeating the same message. Learn how to preach. Actually, that's the one place as a deacon they have real preach. Preach very well. Get good at it. Get crazy good at it. Because you will attract people like none other. And he's an excellent teacher. He's a good man. His heart is in the right place. Uh, it's Deacon Chris Prevon. And he's kind of later in life become this deacon. And uh, he, I, when I do see him, you see he's very conscientious about this. But I, I said, it's, it's one of the three things Christ told us to do, right? And, and it depends upon the, depending upon the translation, it uses the term go out and preach, go out and teach and convert the world in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he says to preach, to heal, and to cast out demons. Those, those three things, um, 
what reaches uh, people the most on a daily basis is preaching. So that's why, you know, we, you know, appreciate appreciate the word of preachers so much because it's the one place that can change the world. It seriously is. It gave Augustine his life through St. Ambrose. And you see the same thing happen by excellent Protestants who know this, who understand this. They get it wrong. They, their substance is wrong, but sometimes they need to be involved uh, in the talents of good preaching. I just want to make a comment with regard to preaching. Um, this came to mind when Father Bowen was speaking to us today. And the difference between preaching well and just preaching is a sense of humility. And I think we need to pray for our priests, especially now, that they preach with humility because that is when they are really listening to Christ and that is the way that the appropriate message can get to us. So often, I think many of our priests, deacons, and even ourselves as Dominicans, sometimes we, we, we want to be that peacock that Father talked about. We want to be the center of the attention. And yet, if we're really truly to act as preachers, we have to act in humility. And that just came to mind. And I agree. You know, one, that's that's big, one of the things that came to my mind when Father was speaking and I so appreciate it was, it's why Christ tells us not to judge. Not so much for the other person, for ourselves, because it shuts down our mind. Mm -hmm. We then quit, the, we quit, we, I've got enough information. You know, if you look at the legal process, you have uh, fact, gathering of facts, application of law, and then conclusions. And our life should be totally involved in the gathering of facts. Look at the law of the church, the gospels, and then very rarely come to judgment, if ever. Now, obviously, you have to judge people because of their actions and things like that. I mean, like when I was, my kids were little, we had a neighbor that was on drugs. I mean, it was a drug house. And you bet, no apologies there. I made a judgment, and I called the police, and they got down there. <laughs> and I have no apologies for that judgment because they arrested a number of people. And it's, there's like things like that in the world. We have to make and observe based upon people's actions and the things they do and say because of the evil they bring. And we need to be a, a breach against that evil. Uh, or we need to be a wall against the breach of that evil is a better analysis. Anyway, thank you, David. Anybody else? Hey, John, don't forget to repeat. Huh? Don't forget to repeat. Repeat the question. Oh, oh I'll do that. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't think none of us in this room have the force of the biggest bullhorn. We don't. We don't have the media. We don't have, uh, we just don't. So the only thing that you can do is to personally talk about it or confront it in a, an 
I emphasize in a uh, respectful and reverent manner with anyone that you're, you're dealing with. And you do so as Father talked about. You know, you, you, uh, you, what were those three things? The end of it was distinguish it. You never condemn it, and you try to agree with where you can and distinguish. And that means posing questions. That's immediately, but oftentimes you might ask, well, why do you think that? Have you, have you ever noticed that when somebody asks you about you, how much that attracts you? Uh, that's also true of people who are interested in what you think. So it's also true in the other direction. If I stand up here and say abortion is a right, and you stand up and say, well, it is not, and you start arguing with me. And then you ask, well, what's the basis of that? You know, just jump. And so I explain it to you, whatever that may be. And then you start distinguishing through questioning. You bring out the lie carefully through the questioning. And it becomes obvious everybody knows where you're coming from. You don't have to declare it. You just simply, uh, most, you know, hopefully everybody in this proverbial room knows you're Catholic. That's one method, and I think it conforms to what Father was saying, is uh, at the end of the day, distinguish. And one of the do way to do that is to ask some questions. I, I, think, the, I think the challenge in what you're saying, John, at least for me, is sometimes when I hear something that is contrary to my own opinion, it's difficult for me to put my opinion aside for that moment, not invalidating it, putting it aside to a point where I can listen to what the other person is saying, and thus, as Father said, seeking the truth. And once I understand where that other person is, at that point, then I'm in a better position to actually uh, <coughs> declare my Opinion and distinguish between what's opinion and what's fact. That's good. And what's so much I hear now in the media in general, regardless of the subject, doesn't matter what the subject is, is that so much of the media is reporting opinion as fact when in fact it's not fact. It's their opinion. You used to have an op ed page in the newspaper. Yeah. And they would tell you this is my opinion. Well, there's not that happening anymore. And right. We need to distinguish between that, and we do that with discernment and prayer. That's just the that's what we can do. That's good. I think I like that. Bonnie and then Mike. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, 
children who went ahead and grew and you know, did well. And, and the, 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 the witness is so powerful that anybody who would see this would understand, well, why? Well, hey, there's, there's some truth here. And it's not necessarily shouting down the other side, but it is a truth that's unmistakable. Yeah. The truth will always work its way out. Good. Bill. Yes. It's a lie. <laughs> For a woman to say it's my body, so I'm pregnant with whatever's in there, and I can do anything I want with it because it's my body. It is if you created yourself. Well, that's beside the point. No way. That is the point. Where did you come from, Ms. or Mrs. or whatever you are? Or self desired God created you. If he didn't, you don't exist. It's very simple. Well, I don't believe in God, yes, perhaps, but he believes in you. That's why he's letting you listen to me. And this is one guy when I was working here. He walked off. He didn't. He walked to it. You can't say anything because you're not a woman. I can't say anything because I'm not a woman. How do you know? <laughs> I'm afraid you misidentified, Phil. <laughs> Very good. That's good. I like that. We get. We get, let's wrap up. And be this. Oh. 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 I don't know if you can read it on that. Yeah, I can. I can. Joshua has a comment. Andrew too. From Joshua says, uh, "Well, actually, first from Andrew Bartell, he says, I believe I understand the reasoning behind Father Doe's approach, but I can." I'm still struggling with the never deny part. Don't we have an obligation to condemn error? Um, and then, I, th I think, I can't speak for Father Doe. Do well, I would say that the deny part, in where you can distinguish, you can distinguish then that you can help them understand The next one says, 
uh, from Joshua, a version of the Socratic method helps to clarify definitions of terms and the position of the other person. It also puts us in a non-antagonistic position mm -hmm. of trying to understand the other person's argument. It is not something we are usually practiced in and is somewhat, hold on, that moved. Um, is somewhat counter to our cultural environment. <laughs> you think? <laughs> uh, people believe what they believe for reasons, often bad reasons, but reasons nonetheless that are not well thought out. And um, my reaction is that that's obvious. We live in a, in a deficiently thinking world and everything about us is pushing us in that direction. And so critical thinking is really absent thinking. And then um, Andrew says, thank you, that helps, Father, and thank you, Joshua. So, um, Ken, you have a question there, Brenda? Um, just a comment. Um, in discussion of Socratic method, I, I attended a training a number of years ago, and it was accurate, and it was called pro-aligned breaks. Pro-aligned Listen well so you can align well to what they're thinking. And that's what kind of posing question does help with the with the getting on the same ground. Father the father did. Yeah, I mean Okay, David? Yeah, this is just a comment. I think sometimes we get, we become so passionate about our position that we want to tell the person that they're absolutely wrong and be very blunt about it. And when we do that, I think we run the risk of just shutting them down to where at that point, they're not even listening to what you're saying, even if it's the truth. Do you know why that's true? Because when you get too passionate, like I do sometimes, it's a form of judgment on the other person. Exactly. Brenda. Yeah. Um, Hold on just a second. We're going to get your microphone. There you go. Oh. Steps. 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 
Thank you. Uh, that's great. I, I think it's a really good example of how to create relationships, inviting them to look at various sources of information. Okay, I just got one last, one last comment. Um, uh, it's just like having been involved in the past, not presently in politics. Um, uh, oftentimes, politicians, ones that that I honor, has I've often said, you have to trust Americans. Americans have a fundamental idea of freedom, and you know there's a lot of truth to that because they eventually pull through um, in various parts of the country. And I, I look, and, and I, I I can't tell you objectively right now why that is. I've got my own opinion. But one of the realities, whether we trust Americans or not, we finally get it. Um, and, and the contrast, you know, in science they say the contrast is to find out what something, what isn't, uh, to find out the characteristics of something that they, it doesn't have to distinguish it from reality. But one thing that's not true in Europe, Europe is in utter decay. Um, they, don't, they don't treasure freedom as we do here. But no matter what the political structure of the United States, Prayers, we have to be Christian, we have to be faithful, because that's really what will launch this country uh, to straighten out its morals, 
where we're headed, honoring truth and reason and the natural law. It, it's not going to be the political process. It will not be the political process, although we see bright lights out there, and there's no question about that. So anyway, that left to that. Uh, we're done for now, and the next is lunch, I think. So go for it. Thank you.